This message entitled, Speak with Grace, Seasoned with Salt, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on September 10th, 2023, by the Reverend Roy D. Warren, Jr. The scripture reference is Colossians 4, 1-6. Father, your mercy and grace, dear God, does abound in these last of days. You are constantly showing us the way to go, which purpose to allow, dear God, to be the what drives us in one direction or another. What, what do you say, Lord? What, what is your purpose for us, dear God, in these days? And so we thank you for this truth that you have before us here today, just in these six verses. We thank you, we praise you, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to be sharing this scripture in the midst of the message, so let's just go ahead and, uh, and get into that, okay? Someone once said that sometimes to communicate well, one has to first start by getting somebody's attention. And you've heard the old joke about the hitting the mule on the side of the head with a two-by-four in order to what? Uh, to get his attention. You want him to do something, he's not listening, <laughs> bam, he gets it. In order to really communicate well, you've got to start with getting somebody's attention, okay? I remember when I was um, a, a kid and, uh, and uh, we would uh, go to church like we all do now, uh, and uh, my, my pastor uh, he always liked to start with uh, some kind of illustration, some kind of story. Might be where I really picked up on that, I'm not sure. I think it's a good idea. I do believe that's what Jesus did. Jesus taught parable after parable after parable. They were, uh, for the most part, maybe not even true stories, okay? But they could have been just as true as well as not. I mean, what I'm saying is, in fact, one parable that he told was about a fella who uh, ended up going to heaven and the other man ended up going to hell. Remember this story? And, and his name was Lazarus. Not the same Lazarus that we know is, is true of John chapter 11, okay, and how he was uh, raised from the dead and all of that. But it's the only parable that we know of in the Bible, really, that has the person's name. So that could be a mostly or totally even true story, okay, because there is a name with it. But generally, they were just, they were illustrations, they were stories. What if a man did this? What if a woman did that? And so forth. And I think that's, uh, that's a good way to get people's attention, I believe. And I, uh, because they, because it all makes a point and it's all going to, I mean, it, okay, so the story itself may not actually be physically true. You understand that. But at the same time, it points to a truth from the scriptures. And I think that's important. All right. So it turns out that there was a fellow by the name of Franklin B. Murphy, Franklin B. Murphy. Now, Franklin worked in the Widget Motor Company for years, and the company was in the process of purchasing some group insurance for the employees. Now, the only condition of the insurance was that there must be 100% compliance. 100% of the employees must choose it, okay? Only one employee not deciding on the insurance would jeopardize everything. Of course, Franklin B. Murphy refused to sign up for the insurance. Nobody was going to make him. Even though 285 other employees out of 286 employees did sign up, he was the only holdout. All right. Well, the foreman got Franklin aside one day and back behind uh, a uh, shelving unit where they could have a little private conversation, tried to get Franklin to sign up, wouldn't do it. The shop steward pleaded with him, that's the guy that runs the union that you know is in that particular 
um, plant and um, still wouldn't do it. The plant superintendent and the general manager, they spent hours trying to reason with Franklin, urging him to sign up for the plan, and he still wouldn't do it. Finally, the general chairman of the board, we're talking top dog here, okay? The general chairman of the board got Franklin aside one day and had him come over to his office. Franklin, he said, I want to level with you. Unless you sign up for this plan, I'm going to fire you. You'll be out of work. Everyone else in this plant wants that insurance except you. Now you need to decide right now if you want that insurance or do you want your job. And old Franklin B. Murphy, he grabbed a pen and he signed up immediately. Later on in the shop, somebody else got him aside and says, why, did you, why didn't you sign up before this? I mean, you were asked a million times, basically, and now all of a sudden you're going to do it. And, and, uh, and he said to the man, he said, well, no one ever explained it to me as clearly <laughs> as the chairman did. Now, he doesn't mean the plan, explain the plan, you know, covered for this or covered for that. No, somebody need to explain it even more clearly than that. Okay? And, and he did. And Franklin did sign up with, uh, for it. I, I guess when it came right down to the consequences of not signing up, which of course was no job, then it all became crystal clear to Franklin. The Bible says that speech needs to be filled with grace and at the same time seasoned with salt. We put a Tozer quote in the paper and I hope I can read this all right. I got enough bright light up here. I should be able to read it and I'll tell you why. I made a photocopy of it right off my phone and, and it printed up everything in black all around it. And, and there's black stripes that run through it. See, my printer is about to run out of ink and it's been telling me that for weeks and weeks. But I keep squeezing more and more ink out of it. I would have wasted a lot of ink if I would have listened to it in the first place and replaced the ink. I did run up to Walmart, okay, when I was ready to do something important and, and get something typed up, probably the, probably the uh, hard copies of the devotional. So I ran up and I got the ink, but I never put it in the printer because it just kept printing and printing and printing. Oh, it'd throw me up a warning every time I start up the computer and want to print something. It said down in the corner, ink level is low, you need to replace it, and so forth and so on. Well, anyway, it's still going, still printing. And, uh, but this turned up a little, not that, not that easy to read, okay? And you might think, well, then why not just read it off the phone? You think I could find it? Same with last week. That's why I didn't share the quote that we put in the paper last week is because it disappeared on me, okay? I mean, out of my gizzy anyway. My, I might have been able to get it out of the laptop. But anyway, I'm just making a point with it, okay? So now it's going to be very difficult to read, but I'm going to try, okay? Here we go. A.W. Tozer once wrote, In prayer, I often ask God to allow me to think about my sin as he thinks about it. I think we ought to spend time in prayer, waiting before God and seeking him. I think we ought to drop off some things that we are doing that are perfectly normal, even right, and certainly not illegal, not even harmful, but they are things that are keeping us from seeking the Lord. 
They are things that are keeping us from prayer. It seems so incongruent that everybody believes in prayer. And you'll hear people, oh yeah, prayer, oh prayer, oh yes. We've got to pray for, that, pray for that, pray for something else and so forth. But yet very few people actually know how to pray. And fewer still practice it with any sort of regularity. Prayer is both the easiest thing to do and the hardest thing that we will ever do at the same time. Now that was a quote that I put in the paper and then I added to the ad, I said, join us this Sunday as we delve into uh, Colossians chapter four, verses one through six. I guess Paul saw this as he concluded his reference previous reference in chapter 3. Remember, last week we saw wives, husbands, children, you know, and then we saw fathers about not provoking the children. And then in verse 22, we saw servants obey in all things your masters uh, according to the flesh. And we mentioned that, you know, back then they did have slavery. And even now today we have employer and employee situations and so forth. But really it's just talking about in dealing with other people, whether they be actually over you uh, in some kind of job situation or whatever. And according to the flesh, not with eye service and not as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the, the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. In other words, there's no, not to be any partiality, um, not to be any favoritism, but rather just doing things for the Lord. Everything that we do is to be done unto the Lord. That's what we saw in the previous section of scripture. That showed up again last week as we were in this about the Christian family. But Paul's not done yet. Paul isn't evidently done yet. Because when he gets into chapter 4, by the way, the chapter numbers and verse numbers, they all came later. <laughs> it's not like Paul says, well, I, I, I'll, let, I'll let chapter 4 go. You know, and then just deal, I'll deal with it later. No, the numbers were all chosen later. Uh, he's still going on about what he's talking about. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. In other words, recognize that everything that you're about, that's what he just said. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and do not unto men. The previous section of scripture that we were in two weeks ago said, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. It just pops up and pops up and pops up. Why? Because it's crucial. We can't see that everything that we do is for some person or for some boss, or whatever. It's unto the Lord. Everything that we're to be about is said to be of the Lord. Okay, look at verses one and two then. We'll take this piece by piece. It's really a set of steps like we talked about last week. And so here's the first step. Verses one and two. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Okay? Continue in the Greek refers to a devotion, to keep it up, to continue steadfastly, to persevere. It implies a strong persistence and a fervor when you do something unto the Lord, it's because he's the Lord. Hold
holding fast to prayer. And here comes a word I've talked about before, watch. Remember, there's another scripture that says, Paul says, watch and pray. And in the Gospels, it says that too, watch and pray. The Greek word is Gregorio, Gregorio. And it means to be spiritually awake or alert. And thus we must devote ourselves intensely to seeking him, intensely to prayer, and remain alert to the many things that would try to detour us from this purpose. Satan and the weakness of our human nature will attempt to cause us to neglect prayer itself and to distract our minds and our thoughts while we are praying. I mean, you ever get into the middle of prayer and all of a sudden you, for the last three or four minutes or something, you can't remember what you were even praying about because your mind went off in some other direction? Satan's the one that's doing that, trying to get your focus off of Jesus. And hence, we must discipline ourselves to achieve the prayer that is required for Christian victory. This was an essential practice of those in the New Testament church, they, and they knew it. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They continued steadfastly in prayers. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, this devotion to God in prayer must be characterized by thanksgiving to Christ for what he has done for us. Praise the Lord. And I think Paul's about to take another step. All right? You got, you got verses 1 and 2. Now look at 3, 4, and 5. Okay? Watch this. 3, 4, and 5. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance. And open, by the way, people, means to open up. Now, would you have guessed that, right? To open means to open up. I think that's a very natural uh, definition, put it that way. Unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. And then in verse four, he says that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Manifest is the Greek word Phanero, we've talked about this before, like epiphanero, epiphany, okay? To make something obvious, to make it conspicuous, it's the same idea. Verse five, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, meaning on the outside, for those that aren't in our number, okay? Might be family members out there, might be neighbors, might be workmates, or maybe people you don't even know. Okay, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. On the outside, in other words. Without means on the outside. Redeeming the time. Okay, to buy it up, to ransom it, to rescue from loss. That's what redeeming the time is all about. The Apostle Paul was confident that God was working with him by opening and shutting doors. Remember that? When Paul was over in uh, Turkey, modern day Turkey, uh, and uh, he was praying and praying and praying what to do, where to go, and God opened a door in Greece. So he traveled across the waters, got over into Greece, and lo and behold, um, found another co-worker. His name was Luke. Okay. From that time on in the book of Acts, the book of Luke, which was written by, I mean the book of Acts rather, that was written by Luke, uh, has obviously has him as the author. And because he's the author, it makes it real clear. It, it, you know, we did this and we did that. Before that, it was, it was all first person. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? God knows what he's doing here, praise the Lord. Okay, so he's opening a door. And, and Luke 
was able to come in and then Luke could be used mightily throughout his ministry. And then there's also the shutting of doors in order to direct his life and his ministry. All right. And the fruitfulness of our lives and our witness for Christ depends both on his providence and on his direct intervention. We should pray for God to open doors for us and to indicate where we ought to be working. You know, how are we to be working? Where are we supposed to be working? And I mean be speaking spiritually more than anything else. What what lives are we intended to uh, touch in this time? Okay? So there's another step. Step one, step two, and now we come to step three. And that we see in verse six. Okay? Let your speech be always with grace. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Okay? Salt, figuratively, it's a picture of prudence, of doing the right thing. You know? It's like I've said many times before, you don't have to get, get your hands on the biggest, blackest King James Bible and beat people over the head. That's not salt. That's not prudence. Now, that doesn't mean you don't correct people in things, okay? But that's why you're speaking with grace, but you season it with salt. Salt preserves, okay? Okay? So you're not just talking with a mouth full of, my, of marbles, you know, and nobody can understand what you're talking about. No, there's a purpose. There's a plan in what you're to be saying to others. They must speak forth the heart of God, and it must be with grace, which means lovingly. So no yelling and screaming, no, you know, pounding on things and pounding on people <laughs> and so forth. You know, but there's also a stern aspect to it, meaning, you, you, you know, you speak with grace, but that grace has to be seasoned with salt. Praise God. A believer's speech must be pleasant, must be winsome, must be kind, must be gracious. It must be a language that results from the operation of God's grace in our hearts. You know, what God has done for us and in us through grace in our hearts. And then we speak the truth in love with grace to others. You see that in Ephesians chapter 4 very clearly. Seasoned with salt, I think, has to, has to mean a conversation that is appropriate and marked by purity, not corruption. Speech with grace, however, does not exclude fervency, does not exclude stern words. It's all got to be there. It's all got to be there when necessary to oppose these false ideas, these false believers. I mean, listen, I was telling stories over here with the kids and talking about going up in a plane and putting a fishing vest on and using it as a parachute. It's not going to work, people. It's not going to work. And if I was serious about that, somebody would have to rise up and say, you're not doing that. You know? I mean, even to the point of grabbing my fishing vest and taking it away from me. Sternness. Stern, Okay? To oppose those false believers who are enemies of the cross. And we're talking spiritually enemies of the cross. We're not just talking about whether or not you think it's a good idea to jump out of a plane with a fishing vest on. Although, you know, that obviously would not be a good thing to do. All right? So you have to, you have to know what the truth is. And the truth of the matter is, Walmart does not sell parachutes. You might as well know that right now. You're not going to find them there. 
If you see something labeled a parachute, somebody's pulling a fast one, okay? This is not gonna happen, all right? We need to recognize the things that are either true or false and, uh, and always stand with the truth, okay? Grace, speak by grace, speak with grace and let it be seasoned with salt. Praise God. Samuel Upham uh, was a beloved seminary professor who lived in the 19th century. And as he lay on his deathbed, dying, some friends and relatives gathered around the bed. And someone asked the question of whether he was still alive. I mean, they couldn't tell. He just wasn't breathing too hard or whatever. They couldn't tell. Someone else suggested that they just feel his feet. Let's just feel his feet. We'll be able to tell from that. And the person said, no one ever died with warm feet. At that moment, Dr. Upham, the man who was passing away, laying there on the bed, they thought he was gone, in fact. He opened one eye and he said, John Huss did. Now, if you know your Reformation history, you know that John Huss was burned at the stake. Now, there's a guy with warm feet. Right, Andrew? <laughs> There's a guy with warm feet burned at the stake. And by the way, those where he said John Huss did, those were his last words. He passed away right after he said that. I have no idea if your feet get warm or cold right before you die or don't die or whatever, but you get his drift. Praise the Lord. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought, how you ought to answer every man. Well, imagine they thought they thought that he might very well be dead. They couldn't see any movement. They didn't see him breathing. But he opens one eye and he starts talking. And they were wrong. He wasn't gone yet. He wasn't dead. Somebody had died with warm feet. And he was going to tell them who. John Huss. Died by being burned at the stake. And hence would have had warm feet. We truly need the truth, okay? And it's not a matter of grabbing the biggest, blackest King James Bible you can find and bopping people over the head, so to speak, with, you know, with the Bible. And it says this, it says this, and bang, bang, slap, slap. That's not the way to do it. It needs to be with love, it needs to be with grace, but there also has to be some salt. There will be times when it feels like it's the biggest, blackest King James Bible ever, especially if you're the one getting it on top of your head. But both really are needed, the promises and the warnings. We've spoken of this before, but it's, it's very, very true. The promises and the warnings. In fact, the one is the other, and the other is the one. A promise is a warning, and a warning is a promise. So if you're going to be trying to throw out all of the warnings, you don't want to hear about warnings, I don't want to hear this, I don't want to hear that, you are also throwing away the promises that God has. They're one and the same thing. So how can that be? Well, simply because our God is all in all, okay? When he says something, that's it. He means it. 
He alone opens the door. He alone manifests how we are to communicate, how we are to reveal, how we can re indeed redeem the time, all these things that it said in these previous verses, the continuing in prayer, the watching in the same with thanksgiving, the opening to us a door, chapter or verse four, to make it manifest, verse five, redeeming the time, all of these things are of God, all right? They are the very things that make it sure that whatever we're saying, whatever we're trying to get across to everybody is seasoned with salt. This is how you ought to answer every person. You know, you don't yell and scream. You don't, like I said, pound on the head with this big black Bible. No, you, you give them what God has to say, okay? With, with, you give them the truth. Ought to answer to every man, and it's the grace. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. I think maybe we should remember about uh, Mr. Murphy. You know, the, one, the guy that didn't want the insurance at first. When he really saw what this was going to mean and what the cost was going to be on these things, what did he do? He grabbed the pencil. He grabbed the pen that he would be able to sign up immediately. Why? Because I don't think, I don't really think that God is going to put it any clearer than he has right here. This is clear as a bell. God's very, very clear about what he's calling us to and what he wants us to be about by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's not expecting you to do it on your own. In fact, he doesn't want you to do it on your own. He doesn't want you to, you know, jump into a situation and, and start uh, lambasting, as they say, and pounding people and so forth and so on. No, you give it by grace, which is by love. But at the same time, they got to know that you mean it. They got to know that God means it. And that's why, I say, that, that's why there's a sternness that comes into the things of God and that makes it clear, no, this needs salt. And what does salt do? It preserves, doesn't it? It preserves. Praise God. Don't really think that God is going to put it any clearer than he put it right here. So you just have to decide. Am I going to sign up for this thing or not? Father, I, I do want to thank you, dear God, that this question is before each and every one of us. Do, will we sign up for this thing? And I do pray, dear God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will truly touch us, each one. And allow, dear God, for your word to become life, dear God, within us. That we may be able to speak it with grace but it also at the same time has to be seasoned with salt. So we thank you, Lord. Your mercy and your love, they abide forever. And I do pray, dear God, that we would allow this to be full and real and complete in each and every one of us. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. And as A.W. Tozer said, and once again said so very clearly, we must often ask God to allow us to think about our sin the way he thinks about it. And then we'll know for a fact how seriously he was willing to take our sin. I mean, all the way to the cross of Calvary. Praise the Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray.
Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen.